at 328,000 feet above the Earth. Air is too thin to sustain winged flight. Beyond this boundary, known as the Kármán line, space begins. Yeah, this is the lab. Um, it's kind of messy, usually consistently messy, um, but so it goes. We got a table here we use to just do homework at, and chill out. So these guys are working on homework right now. Um, and then we have some freezers for storing composites, pallet rack, pallet rack over there, flame cabinets. Um, and then most of the work in lab gets done on this table and on that table. So I am out of my Tunisian. Uh, I am a senior uh, at USC in astronautical engineering. Basically anything I can help out with, I, I am at this point. We try to make everything in-house. We even make our own propellant. The singular lab goal has been getting a rocket to space. The lab was founded about 13 years ago and has since grown to over 100 people contribute to the, the builds that we do. Really, our goal is to be the first undergraduate organization to hit the Kármán line. Um, with that, we need to prove that we actually hit the Kármán line. And in order to do that, we need data and data is my job. Yeah. Um, there are hardware sheets though in the camera. But like, I'm worried that it's gonna like be out of the nose cone and like hamster and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's other teams out there trying to do it and more power to them, but it, it feels almost like a space race and that it's so close. Is any other student group trying to get the space? A lot of other student groups are trying to get the space. I mean, this was once the task of nations. My name is Peter Yosebio, and I'm the lead recovery engineer for the OC Rocket Propulsion Lab. So far, we've gone about halfway there with Fathom 2, which was our last high-performance vehicle we launched last year. Now we're moving to a space shot vehicle, Traveler 3. For the launch of Traveler 3, we will be launching out of Black Rock Desert, which is in northern Nevada. There's not really anything for miles and miles around. The biggest issue is safety, making sure that everybody is aware of the hazards of being in the desert. And, you know, as the operations person, it's my job to be on top of those and make sure that everybody is as safe as possible. When I lived in Florida, um, my dad took me to go see the first return to flight launch for the, the space shuttle, and that did it. That was the moment that sealed the deal. Why would I do anything but this? This is so cool. It's 9.23 on Thursday night, which is the first night of frat parties, um, mind you. And the idea that I'm going to Rocket Lab is what gets me through my day. For me, this is this giant accumulation of goals that I have had since I was little and like dressing up in astronaut costumes, since I was like 15, and then again right before college when I told myself, one day you're gonna do something that goes into space. You can test all of this without having this. Without avionics, it, it kind of goes almost as this unsung hero. If avionics doesn't work, there is no way of quantifying where we are. We, we will not know if we hit space. Right now we're doing setup for the recovery testing, so we're going to need to drill a few holes for the shear pins, and we're going to drill avionics vent holes. Right now we're putting the retention ring and the forward bulkhead in, followed by the recovery sheet template, followed by the hamster unit and the avionics sheet template, which is what the recovery system seeks against. So this is the shock cord that tethers the airframe to the nose cone, so that when we eject the two, they don't go flying off from one another and we're able to climb them together in one piece. Attached to the shock cord, we have the parachute. I just love that. Okay. Hey, Alejandro, do you have the snap ring for the avionics sheet template? The snap ring? It's not there. How's it looking? You mean the case is not flat? But it should be putting a gap here, which means it's really bad if there's a gap down here. Can you guys rotate the case so we can see what yeah, it's like? Yeah, lift the case and rotate it. Uh, Damn it. Okay, we're gonna have to sand that down before we can go. Also, we haven't found the snap ring yet. Hey, Connor. Yo, Paul. We need the tote. 
baby, understood. Yeah. Me too. Okay. We got a snap ring here. Here we go. We're gonna wanna measure that, then we're gonna draw in the case of silver sharpie and we're gonna sand it down to that point. Yes, got it? I don't have another one. Awesome. Thank God. Whew, that is four pins. It took us like two weeks to get that to work last year. Yeah. Awesome. That could not have gone better. Let's get this meeting started if you don't mind. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to the general meeting. Uh, most of you probably know me at this point. I am Sydney. I'm the operation lead. Rob. <laughs> uh, anyways, the big thing. We are now pretty much ready to launch Traveler 3. Woo! <laughs> so, motor integration will be on next Friday, the 21st. And they're going to basically, in short terms, take one tube and shove it inside of the other tube and hopefully not get anything stuck. Traveler 3 originally was supposed to be launched in May of 2018, and we were ready to integrate the rocket, and it was three days before our intended launch date. Now, I was not there, but I heard many stories of integration. Integration is when a whole team of people tried to get the motor into the motor case. And then you slick it with this glue, uh, this red stuff called RTV. The glue cures in an hour and uh, we realized at about 40 minutes in that we had brought the wrong ring. We were only like two inches. We were so close to having the motor all the way integrated. And at that point, the glue is 90% cured, and it's very, <laughs> very solid. The RTV cured the motor into the wrong position with respect to the motor case, which scrubbed the launch, and here we are four or five months later? Four months. There were people crying that night. So, that was not a fun time. Avionics is definitely in crunch time, as we kind of tend to be as we get closer to flight. Really, the next few days, for me, are going to be me debating how many all-nighters we're going to have to pull, um, which is totally fine. We just need to make sure that everything is as redundant as we can make it, and that all the data that needs to get there does get there. Um, so now, here I am, stress baking pancakes on Sunday morning, and I'm going to get back to it. Shortly, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. Just pull up a little closer. Well, uh, 
we made it. This is Black Rock <laughs> Desert. I've also lost my voice, which is great. Today, Jay and I get the victorious task of debugging the rest of the flight code. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna power um. squad this one. <laughs> it's gonna be great. A thousand on temp, a thousand on barrel, a hundred on acceleration. Yes. You know, it's Connor, not a bad we just got a confession. <laughs> he just said Windows is a little more susceptible to failure. Oh! <laughs> 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 it's a dust storm. Adam, yeah. we should move this stuff in the trailer. Yes, we Can we get some help moving this stuff into the trailer? Yeah. Just kind of seal up the tent and then move things that are at risk. and check if clean um, and then confirm max altitude is being written because of the a prior and it was a code This is the last chance that we all have to touch it. So actually, yeah, everybody want to touch the system? <laughs> all right, answer. Is ready? So Peter, we are currently behind by ten minutes. So is there anything that you can delegate here by parallel pathing? So start on the recovery G10 plate. Get in, uh, clean it, put it in the all thread. We're not using an aft nut, it's going up against the camera mount. Okay, guys. Adam, Adam, we have no data. They launched without avionics to go ahead. So we have no data. Well, I don't know. Well, okay, guys. Um, since it was spiraling towards the end, uh, it should be just passed and directly over us that way. So, again, heads up. Oh, I don't see a parachute. If it's gonna make it, it will already be on its way by now. What? <laughs> so stay here. 
here, stay calm, stay near cars in case something starts whistling down. It came that way? That way, roughly? I heard a boom and then I heard a thud. No, no, I can't tell. It's gotta be the radio. All right, everybody. So the countdown began and ended without our go. Um, we were not able to arm the avionics system in time, meaning it was in standby state of launch. That means that the hamster system reported no data. Um, it means the Ravens were off. So no chance of parachute deployment. That's the situation. We should have been following our go. Ultimately, that day, we lost Traveler 3. Um, they couldn't get the avionics guys on the radios, and I told them to try and call them, and um, they were having difficulty with their cell phones. We get a kind of overheard, weird radio. Connor signals back and says, all right, you know, wait for the avionics go. Um, what was heard, we believe, is the, the pieces that were heard by the tower team were, okay, avionics, go. If we'd done a proper go-no-go -go poll or the launch status check, it wouldn't have happened at all because avionics would have given a no-go. And all of a sudden we hear a countdown that starts from five. I was, you know, I was the operations lead. I was the launch coordinator, you know. This failure was in my wheelhouse. It was our space shot. And for me, it was the space shot where my software was going to be on it. it didn't work. This mission was a failure. Like the computer didn't leave the pad. You know, we're gonna get the team together and actually come up with, you know, solid solutions to prevent this from ever happening again. You either let moments like this break you, or you look at them for what they are and then you get back up and you try again. What's next for Rocket Lab? T4. This is really cool to be able to actually like start from the beginning again. Yeah. It's a fresh start. And we're going to talk briefly about what happened at the Traveler 3 launch, the day of why we were all furiously at our computers. And I kind of outlined some brief requirements of what the, our software should do for any revision. In rebuilding the system, we were able to fix a lot of issues that we knew we had coming into the Traveler 3 fight. It's exciting because we kind of got to do like a free update. It seems that we took all of the things that went wrong from Traveler 3 and Fathom 2 and we incorporated them into how we're going about doing things for Traveler 4. And it's working really well.
not only is rocketry kind of built on this basis of a bunch of I told you you couldn't do that kind of science and experimentation, but to do it at a collegiate level and to reach space at that level. I mean, it, it's this embodiment of just taking the impossible, grabbing the reins, you know, taking everyone's technical skill set and building something and defying those odds. It's this physical manifestation of doing the impossible. I just can't believe it's here. Like, we're back out again. We're doing our thing. These are three quarters. It's fine. I can just put my back out. Yeah, no this worries. Is Max, who is the propulsion team here? Yeah. If this works, it will be our first successful recovery deployment on a high performance vehicle in more than 10 years of lab history. I, I think I'd be stupid to think that R1 is the one that's finally going to work, considering it's literally never worked before. People generally don't trust recovery because recovery has never worked. We joke, but the hamster unit's our baby. And especially this time around, it's crazy. To have that just be a unit that we have 100% made ourselves and to send that and say, I was a part of that. So, uh, this is it. Um, I don't think I need to explain how excited and uh, terrified we yeah. should be. <laughs> <laughs> I am powering the hamster unit on. Peter? This is Connor checking in. We have successfully handed the unit off for recovery. Over. Avionics unit going in. Yeah, I'm going to detention it in here. But there are people like Max addressing step 14. We are ready to receive rockets. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, we are good to go. Avionics is go to go to the pad. Over. All right, Neil here. The uh, truck is rolling out right now. Over. Remember, we're inserting the rocket aft end first. We're going to keep the Traveler logo in the top left corner. Fly! Stop. Perfect. Stop. Stop. Excellent. This is Max. Rocket is fully inserted into the tower. Over. T minus 18 minutes. Uh, good to raise the tower, over. This is Connor, uh, we're gonna proceed with arming the avionics. Confirm the air and range are clear. This is Dennis, we are now beginning our go halt check. Peter, is recovery go? This is Peter, recovery is go, over. Just a general heads up, we're at like the upper limit of our wind tolerance, over. Connor, are the avionics go? Dennis, avionics are go. Over. We are go for launch. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. should not have wiggled or spiraled nearly as much as it did. Um, we appear to be getting pieces of package. Over. Oh my god. We appear to be out of the atmosphere. Yes! Yes!
dumping our data. Coming down, Mr. Shoot. Drop recovery. Start walking. that the thing that I invested a uh, probably excessive amount of my time into uh, actually paid off in the way that I had hoped it would every single year that I was there. It's this one little moment of did everything work perfectly together at this one time and to say that you know we got together built everything from scratch and put all the pieces together and made it like it's like a rocket science high. Like, that's what we live for. It's one of the few things that I think in my life I can say I would go back and do it all over the same. The entirety of lab history was leading up to this point. Traveler 4 was the culmination of more than a decade of blowing up rockets and we just happened to be there to push it over the finish line. It's done. <laughs>